Today I'm speaking with award-winning investigative journalist Russ Baker. He is the author of Family of Secrets, The Bush Dynasty, The Powerful Forces That Put It in the White House, and What Their Influence Means for America. Russ is the editor of news site whowhatwhy.org, and he is here today to discuss some of the topics his team of reporters are investigating, including the impending war with Syria, inconsistencies with the Boston Marathon bombing, and this whole NSA spying debacle, and why Obama can't undo the surveillance society even if he wanted to. Okay, Russ, so thank you so much for joining us uh, on the InfoWars Nightly News. We're happy to have you. My pleasure. So now we'll start with the Obama administration and the NSA spy scandal. Now we've heard Obama say that he's going to get to the bottom of, you know, some of the other scandals going on with the AP wiretapping, the IRS, uh, Benghazi. Now he's saying that he's welcoming a debate into this new affront on the American people. You know, Rand Paul says Obama is drunk on power. You say he is essentially helpless. Do you really think that Obama wants to stop the surveillance society that that we have if he could? You know, I, I can't read his mind. I don't have any real sense of what type of person he is uh, after all of these years. And I think we're always sort of uh, dependent on uh, perceptions that are crafted by uh, the electronic media. Uh, but uh, my sense is that even if he wants to do something, and I'll give him the benefit on the, of the doubt on some of the promises that he made when he was running for office, and in fact his criticism of George W. Bush on very similar surveillance policies, I, I think realistically he just can't do anything about it. Uh, in fact, that has been a theme in my work and uh, in our work on whowhatwhy.com. Uh, that uh, if you look back historically, you'll see all the way back to Franklin Roosevelt, he was basically warning that he, his hands were somewhat tied by people in the financial centers. He wrote a letter uh, to Colonel House, the uh, former chief uh, aide to Woodrow Wilson. He said, you and I both know that the real power in this country resides not in Washington, but in the great financial centers. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower, I think, was very much under the thumb of these same interests and uh, took a very bold move as he was leaving office with his uh, famous military-industrial complex speech. So I think that all of these presidents essentially uh, are uh, very limited in what they can do. To some extent, uh, they're ac actors chosen for their ability to perform uh, publicly. And I think that uh, whenever, on the rare occasion, we've had someone like a Roosevelt or particularly a John F. Kennedy who challenged these power centers, they uh, quickly were put in their place, sometimes violently. I think that to some extent the range of the permissible is such that the people from both parties are essentially uh, wings of the same party and that they understand that the uh, that really all they can do is wiggle a little bit uh, and that's why you don't see huge differences in the kinds of policies by and large being proposed by uh, cabinet secretaries and top advisors. I think that's just a reality and uh, uh, so we, we certainly see that in carryovers. Um, um, even John F. Kennedy, many of the people in his cabinet were Republicans or were carryovers from the Eisenhower administration. It was just a shuffling, really. Right. So I guess if Obama is blocked, then that means democracy itself is blocked. I mean, doesn't that signal sort of a problem? Um, I think so. Um, in my book, Family of Secrets, I... Uh, look at the rise of the Bush dynasty and I connect it to all kinds of traumatic events in this country including the assassination of John F. Kennedy uh, and um, the, the, the issue is that we don't really understand these big events we don't understand uh, what is going on and we don't really recognize uh, domestic coups when they occur uh, this sort of thing causes dissonance with a lot of people who like to believe that this country is so much better than other countries that those sorts of things don't go on, but in fact it's reasonable to assume that the very same people in this country who think it's perfectly okay to go into other countries and mess about with their democracies and overthrow their leaders would not hesitate to do the same thing in this country. I think because the stakes are so much higher and it's so much riskier that those kinds of things are much more carefully planned and carried out, uh, but I think that any person who becomes president would have to be a complete idiot not to realize that they are expected to do certain things. Now I know that Who What Why has been reporting for about two years saying that the Obama administration was not to be trusted 
in giving the whole official narrative of why they want to oust Assad for humanitarian reasons. And so what do you think about the New York Times basically reporting that Obama finally had to succumb to tremendous pressure to get involved in Syria? Right. Uh, almost everything you read in the mainstream media are calculated leaks. So um, um, they start by leaking things that uh, indicating that they're going to be moving forward with uh, military aggression against the Assad regime. Uh, and then they leak that Obama didn't really want to do it. These are all calculated. So, for example, whether or not Obama wanted to do it, that leak, that last leak you referred to, is designed to mollify his base. Those who still believe that he's basically a decent guy and that he still has some kind of power. And so it's very important for them to, to you know, and so instead of him saying, I had to do it because the generals forced me or Wall Street forced me or what have you, he says, I had to do it because Bill Clinton uh, pressured me, which is quite funny. And of course, that's setting up Hillary Clinton to run for president herself. Um, but what, what really is going on is that none of those wars are about humanitarian things at all. They never have been. Uh, they never will be, uh, frankly, nor should they be. Uh, if uh, you or I were sitting in the Pentagon or in the National Security Council, we were discussing what to do in other countries, we wouldn't be discussing uh, human rights and uh, how to uh, uh, make people in Pakistan happier and so on. We'd be talking about so-called national security, which broadly defined uh, is uh, what benefits the United States, which uh, more narrow defined uh, means what benefits those who have the most power in this country and that really comes down to a, 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 po a continued policy of a, a kind of a, uh, a, a kind of an imperial approach uh, and the United States isn't alone on that I think China and Russia and so forth we're all battling for uh, markets and resources it's been that way uh, since time immemorial exactly and so what do you think about the ties between the mainstream media and the Obama administration the uh, president of CBS News is related to his uh, aspiring novelist turned deputy national security advisor, Benjamin Rhodes. So it seems like the mainstream media is sort of getting us warmed up to go to war with Syria or initially it was Libya. And what do you think about that? Well, that's quite right. In fact, uh, I mean, I think we can see that the mainstream media has learned nothing from its errors and then subsequent mea culpas over Iraq and all the other things that they got wrong and how they were tricked, perfectly happy to continue along that path. And we see that with Libya uh, on who, what, why we've been... Um, I think we were quite early to that story and still are virtually alone in reporting that that was never about uh, uh, the... Uh, Gaddafi uh, uh, policies towards his own people. It was always about other geopolitical and strategic considerations. Uh, we detail that quite heavily in an article you can find on the right-hand side of our site, Who, What, Why. Uh, also, uh, uh, Syria, uh, has other issues in play, but again, uh, uh, strategic calculations. And the media, uh, uh, for some reason, uh, to, I, I'd like to say it's inexplicable to me, but I think it's perfectly explicable. Uh, the way our media is structured, uh, it's, it's dependent primarily on funding from uh, wealthy interests, uh, from the patronage of uh, wealthy consumers and so forth, and that really is uh, where their bread is buttered. Uh, and so they're, they're, they're going to do some good reporting. There's no question. I mean, I've worked in the mainstream media. I have plenty of friends in it. Um, uh, I made a decision to leave it and to start Who, What, Why, because I felt that we were constrained. We weren't able to tell the whole story. So you'll see bits of the story there, uh, but you've got to really kind of uh, step back and take your own reading to figure out what really is going on. Right. And so you guys are, are doing a lot of investigative journalism and uncovering the news, basically the things that the news fails to report on or just kind of covers. For instance, you all are digging a little deeper into some of the inconsistencies with the Boston Marathon bombings. Um, we've covered that here at InfoWars as well, so what, what else can you tell me? Well, sure. I mean, so so we're sort of old-fashioned journalists. There are many, many uh, outlets, of course, that comment on the news and express their opinions and speculate. We do real old-fashioned reporting, and so I spent weeks myself in Boston on the ground going and talking to people. Uh, we have other people. We're, we've built a team, other people working on the story, doing analysis, doing all kinds of things. And very importantly is that we go into these stories without an agenda. And now some people would say, yeah, sure, nobody goes in without an agenda. But to be a good journalist, you really have to do that. You have to say, I would 
want to know what happened there. I want to know if these two guys did it. I want to know if there were other people helping them. Uh, I want to know everything. I want to know about all these anomalies. I want to know why uh, uh, the younger brother, uh, why they uh, uh, shot him so many times uh, in that boat when, in fact, he had no weapon. Uh, I want to know whether he really scrawled a confession on the wall. Why? How somebody who was uh, so gravely wounded could have or would have been inclined to prop himself up and scrawl a confession. It makes you think that uh, somebody thought that he was going to die. So, I mean, these are all very, very strange things, uh, and somebody has to look into them. So our attitude is we, we're agnostic uh, until we do our research. So what are some of the other stories that you would really, if Obama could save himself and kind of gain a little trust with the public again, what are some of the stories you'd like for him to unclassified? Well, I mean, uh, as you probably know from who, what, why we've been talking a lot about the remaining classified records of the John F. Kennedy assassination, um, very troubling that uh, there are still an estimated 50,000 documents with references or, or information that appears to be related to the Kennedy assassination that the government has held back. Here we are on the 50th anniversary of what the government has told us was simply uh, a lone uh, eccentric or perhaps nutty figure shooting Kennedy that there was nothing more to that. If that's true, then uh, it's hard to understand what could possibly need to remain secret 50 years later. And so we see with Obama him sort of continue again, uh, like uh, Bush and like other presidents, in cooperating with this uh, 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 what, what I guess you would say is a policy of uh, assuring us that it's better that we don't know, that for democracy to work well, uh, we need to be protected from ourselves. We don't have good judgment as to what it is that we can know. And of course, they're always referring to America's enemies, but I'd love for them to articulate who are America's enemies who would gain if they released all the records on the John F. Kennedy assassination. So what do you think we would actually find if those documents were released? Well, I was, uh, again, agnostic on the Kennedy assassination, as I am on most topics, until I happened upon it uh, in a sort of bizarre way while researching the Bush family and discovered that George H.W. Bush couldn't remember where he was on November 22, 1963. I decided to just figure out where he was because I know that everybody over the age of five uh, remembers where they were when they heard about the shooting of Kennedy. And so uh, that took me down this kind of rabbit's hole, and I became fascinated with the Kennedy assassination. I spent spent some years on it um, and have actually about five chapters in Family of Secrets on the Kennedy assassination, I have become convinced that, in fact, that was a uh, essentially a, a coup d'etat, that, in fact, elements of uh, military intelligence and uh, of other spy agencies, the CIA and the FBI, at least were involved in covering it up, uh, also involved with uh, uh, the autopsy in order to hide the fact that there were uh, multiple bullets hit Kennedy from uh, more than one direction, all of which points to the fact that it was an organized uh, hit. Uh, and so I think that uh, that is even shown from some of the documents that have already been released uh, by uh, the, the diligent efforts of, of, of amateur researchers uh, sort of connecting the documents. And I think that whatever those remaining 50,000 are, they must be pretty explosive. I'd certainly like to take a look at them. Well, I know we would all definitely love to get to the bottom of that story as well 50 years later. But now the New York Times has sort of said people who question the official, the official story are just conspiracy theorists. So how do you reconcile that being an award-winning investigative journalist? Now they're calling you conspiracy theorist. <laughs> Well, I don't know if they're specifically calling me that, but the, the general message has been put out consistently over the years, and they've stepped up the effort this year to sort of remind people that uh, asking questions and not trusting the official story is dangerous. And so uh, this term conspiracy theory is one that I personally abhor because uh, it's actually too... Uh, useful words, conspiracy meaning uh, two or more people getting together to commit a crime, which is not a fantasy, it's a reality, and it's prosecuted in courthouses throughout the country on a daily basis, and theory, which is how we learn and how we come to understand things. So conspiracy theory really ought to be a neutral term 
referencing uh, attempts to understand how crimes are committed. Uh, and it's sort of tragic that that term has been taken over. Uh, it's now what you might call a dysphemism uh, instead of a euphemism. It's a, a word or a phrase that automatically uh, uh, a sort of taints whoever you apply it to and it just shuts the discussion down. Now I'll be the first to say that I am not a fan uh, of those who believe that there is something sinister going on with everything that the, uh, that person themselves is not involved with. I don't think that's healthy and I think there's been too much of a growth industry in that in this country but I do think that we have to go in with an open mind and accept that sometimes people in the government are doing good work uh, and exactly what they tell us is the truth. I think it's very very important to appreciate that the government is full of uh, uh, millions of people just like ourselves um, but at the same time be open to the idea that uh, there are individuals whether it's in the uh, civilian parts of the government or the military or the CIA uh, or in private industry or in nonprofits or anywhere else who uh, have uh, uh, untoward agendas and, and I think that that's uh, that's the important thing and I think that Places like the New York Times, which sort of disparage people who want to know, could all of these shootings throughout America's history, could they all have been lone kooks? When we look at other countries, uh, we see that most of them uh, eventually are settled as having been hits by powerful interests to remove people. And the idea that none of these people, whether it was Martin Luther King or Robert Kennedy or John F. Kennedy or even statistically if you look at small plane crashes, uh, statistically, a uh, disproportionate share of those are, are labor leaders and, and sort of a liberal politicians. That's actually a fact, or they're uh, conservative politicians uh, who, who fell afoul of their buddies, uh, people who were on the Warren Commission, people like John Tower. It's a fascinating subject, and to think that nobody would ever uh, be requested or inclined to go and take a screwdriver and loosen a bolt and an engine or something. I mean, it's, it's, that's preposterous. And what kind of journalists just dismiss any uh, consideration of these scenarios? Uh, I would say that they are the ones that are irresponsible. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of that irresponsible, irresponsibility in journalism. Yeah, I mean, I, I think so. I, you know, journalism is like anything else. It's funded largely uh, uh, by uh, wealthy interests uh, and uh, by uh, the capitalist system. And uh, uh, that it means that there are going to be limitations on what people can report. Uh, those of us who have worked in the mainstream media know that we try to do the best job we can, but we understand there are limitations and we self-censor uh, or our editors in usually only slightly subtle uh, terms uh, inform us of when we've gone too far. I remember one story, uh, an editor said to me, go out and bring me a big story. I brought him something which I thought was very big. He looked at it and he said, uh, that's too big. So Russ, you covered the fall of communism in East Germany and you likened the fall of that surveillance society to something that we could achieve here in the U.S. How so and do we stand a chance? I think my point is that uh, I and many other people have grown increasingly nervous as we see uh, our so-called enemies uh, having become freer and freer and us become less and less free. Uh, there's a certain kind of an irony and a paradox in that, of course, um, and, 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 and some poetry as well. But uh, I, I think that, that these measures that are being taken increasingly to supposedly protect us do not protect us. They essentially enslave us. Uh, I I think they have a very hard time showing us uh, that we are safer, uh, showing that even if we are safer, that these kinds of measures and this kind of total surveillance of all of society to catch a few people is actually worth it uh, in the long run. If you ask people, uh, uh, would you give up your freedom uh, to uh, ensure a slightly lower risk that you will be blown up? Uh, I don't think people would. Uh, and I think we need to have a vigorous discussion about that. I, I also think that uh, we need to acknowledge that there are people in this country in positions of power, uh, of great wealth and so on, who are less uh, excited about democracy um, uh, than they say they are. Um, that they were uh, supporters of uh, fascists and others, uh, perfectly happy with a Pinochet uh, or a Franco uh, and so their their commitment to democracy is something that I would question and I think that when they're pushing for knowing more and more about us and at the same time paradoxically telling us less and less about our own government uh, we have reason to be deeply deeply alarmed and um, 
I mean, I, I do support uh, having uh, security measures that are necessary, but I think we need to have much more accountability. And I think that uh, uh, one of the things I saw when I was in East Germany, I, I referenced this briefly in a recent article on Who, What, Why, is that uh, I was there literally before the wall came down, and I saw uh, when there was a break and there was a sense that they could be free, that individuals began stirring and they began taking action. And I saw young people who had put on ski masks and then get on buses and hand out leaflets. And I, I attended a, a meeting uh, with a, uh, a Christian church leader there and his congregation where sort of a covert meeting where they began discussing what they might be able to do and so forth. And it was very exciting to see. And I think it's sad that in this country, more people don't step up and do something. And it's, it's really not enough to just sort of uh, uh, complain. Uh, you have to get involved. And the, the reality is if enough people made their voices heard and went out in the street, uh, we're more active uh, on the internet in terms of sharing important articles with other people. Uh, I think at some point the elected representatives would have to respond to that, would have to listen, and we might have a real fighting chance to preserve democracy before it's too late. Well, I agree, but I wonder, do you think that we're a little sort of trapped because everything is so electronically you know, connected now and that's sort of being spied on and with you know, Google algorithms and things like that that can sort of steer which way things get shared. Um, do we need to unplug and just get back to the word of mouth and handing out leaflets? Well, I mean, I think we do need to try to appreciate the joys of life, which include uh, actually being with people in the flesh, uh, uh, saying hello to neighbors on the street, that it's not the same thing as bragging about how great your vacation was on Facebook. Um, you know, I think that we need to unplug unplug a bit, as you point out. Uh, I think we need people, unfortunately, who can have the same uh, electronic skills that the others have to maybe f help us find ways to protect our own privacy. Uh, and, and I think that, very importantly, we need to be more suspicious of all of this technology as just being something good. I particularly am struck uh, by the younger generation and its enthusiasm for everything. I think these things like Google Glass uh, are real uh, violations of our privacy. And I think that the, the fact that, that we don't hear more young people saying these are bad developments, I want to stop it. I mean, you know, there could be boycotts of Google and Apple and all of these things if people cared enough. And I think those companies would respond because, after all, they're for-profit enterprises. Well, that sounds like some really good material for a new book <laughs> or a whole other new book. So what are you working on now? Well, I don't formally announce books until I get uh, at publication or close to publication, but I could just say that uh, some of the topics that we discussed uh, here today are definitely things that I'm looking at. Um, I, I feel like I've got a whole bunch of books in me, and the real problem is just uh, time constraints. Exactly. Well, Russ, thank you so much for continuing to investigate and uncover the news. I know there's obviously, as we have proven here today, there is so much more uh, news that remains to be answered. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Well, thank you very much.